Good afternoon. Uh, I want to thank ASAP for inviting me to participate in this uh, unusual online meeting. And I want to uh, extend my thanks to Dr. Slavin for inviting me and to Patricia, uh, Patrice Schaubman and to Rebecca for their help in uh, making this a uh, reality. Uh, I would like to talk this afternoon about uh, primary spinal syringomyelia. And just so that we know what uh, and all agree as to what we're talking about, we're talking about syringomyelia that has its origin with an ab in abnormality in the spine itself, rather than um, syringomyelia that uh, is uh, uh, present because of a Chiari malformation. Uh, that is to say, an abnormality at the junction of the skull and the spine. This is, we're talking about uh, abnormalities that are entirely within the spine. And uh, just so that we have a uh, common understanding as to how and why this happens, uh, most of you are well informed about these conditions, but uh, let me just uh, say that uh, spinal fluid, uh, also called CSF, cerebrospinal fluid, is a watery fluid that is produced in all of us from blood uh, 24 hours a day and is taken back at the same rate at which it is produced into the bloodstream. And this uh, cerebrospinal fluid pulsates uh, uh, together with uh, uh, heart rate and pulse and respiration. So it is constantly pulsing uh, because as the brain expands intermittently, when it fills with blood, when the heart contracts, that sends a pulse wave along the uh, entire spinal fluid. And then uh, the spinal fluid, of course, resumes uh, in normal uh, activity when the pulsation stops, but it is intermittently uh, pulsing. And when this pulsation uh, encounters a partial obstruction uh, to the spinal fluid, it becomes easier for the spinal fluid to enter into the spinal cord than to travel uh, alongside its uh, outer surface. And um, this is particularly true if the uh, spinal cord has been injured uh, in a spinal cord injury uh, uh, and the fluid can enter, uh, as you can see here, uh, through a hole uh, and it can both enter and leave this fluid cavity uh, all the time. But this is a rare uh, circumstance and in the majority of people, even those who have a spinal cord injury, uh, this is, there is no such uh, traumatic uh, break in the surface of the spinal cord. Uh, there are a number of uh, situations, uh, abnormalities that can cause uh, this type of partial obstruction to the flow of spinal fluid. The most common is uh, spinal cord injury. Uh, but it can also happen after a scar that is formed following surgery for removal of a tumor or some other problem along the surface of the spinal cord. Uh, the second most common form is um, uh, after inflammation. And we want to be sure that we uh, know the difference between inflammation and infection. Infection elicits one type of inflammation, but uh, normal blood uh, in somebody who has had an injury or uh, a spontaneous uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage can elicit scar tissue in more in some people, we don't understand why, than in others. Uh, bone fragments from a spine injury, uh, spine deformity, and rarely a large, uh, very large disc herniation can all produce this type of partial obstruction or blockage of the uh, subarachnoid space. Uh, arachnoid cysts are developmental abnormalities that uh, are the uh, 
in the form of a folding of the arachnoid, which is one of the membranes uh, over the surface of the spinal cord. And this fold can produce a pocket that prevents the normal flow of spinal fluid and can then result in serious formation. And rarely uh, tumors uh, can produce this. Now, in case of tumors, uh, there's a lot of um, misunderstanding, but the tumors of the spinal cord may actually have a cyst. And when there's a cyst with this uh, tumor, uh, the cyst fluid is often yellowish and has a high protein. But if you can understand from what I've just told you that if the tumor is large enough to produce blockage of spinal fluid um, coursing along the surface of the spinal cord, it can also result in a true uh, syrinx with watery fluid, which is identical with spinal fluid. But that's an important distinction. So uh, in summary, for this part, syringomyelia can be regarded as a symptom of subarachnoid stenosis or subarachnoid blockage. And just so that we are clear about the membranes, you know that the uh, brain and spinal cord are encased in membranes, which collectively are called meninges. And the outer one, the most firm one, is the dura. Uh, the next one is the arachnoid, which derives its name from a, a spider web. And if you know any Latin or Spanish, you recognize the word. And it is transparent and very thin. And then the last one, innermost one, uh, is the pia, which is closely applied to the spinal cord. But the spinal fluid is uh, contained within this uh, arachnoid or very thin translucent membrane, and it pulsates within that. And that said, the treatment has to be directed at eliminating the partial blockage or partial obstruction wherever possible. Uh, for the most part, we are very fortunate today to have MR scan, both with and without contrast material, to help us define these. But occasionally, uh, MR scan does not give us the precise kind of uh, localization of the abnormality that we need as surgeons in order to plan our surgical approach. And uh, in some instances, as uh, I'll mention again, it is desirable to bracket the uh, blockage from above and below with uh, myelography. Myelography can help to define the surgical strategy in this sense, and it is particularly helpful when we see a syrinx cavity on MR scanning without an identifiable source or scar for the abnormality. It is helpful when we have a diffuse or honeycomb syrinx. It is very helpful in identifying an arachnoid cyst and sometimes we want to see the upper and lower limits of a focal scar so that we know exactly what the best way is of treating this. Uh, <clears throat> one of the limitations of MR scanning is that uh, unlike the uh, Chiari situation where we can get a flow study, we do not have a comparably good flow uh, study at this time for the spine. And so a focal obstruction can be missed uh, that way. And also, if it is out of the imaging plane uh, of the MR scan, and it is hard to define uh, the uh, full rostrocaudal extent, that is to say, up and down extent of the obstruction. So if necessary, the myelogram should be performed by inserting the contrast uh, at uh, the high cervical region as well as the lumbar region. So we're going to talk first about post-traumatic syringomyelia, which some people like to call post-traumatic spinal cord cavitation. And uh, the treatment options that we have available for this most common form of primary spinal syringomyelia uh, 
are first and foremost resection of the scar or web whenever possible. If the scar is too extensive or cannot be uh, resected, an expansile duroplasty, or which we might think of as CSF bypass, uh, is performed. And just to draw a crude analogy, if you think of a, a freeway or highway being blocked, you go around uh, the surface roads uh, to bypass the blockage. And in the same way, we can uh, place a dural graft that uh, allows the fluid to go around the obstruction uh, and uh, go down in its normal course. And last, we uh, may need to uh, consider shunting the syrinx uh, or shunting the subarachnoid space above the level of the syrinx uh, in order to uh, diminish the size of the syrinx cavity. And I'll talk about each of these. Uh, just some clinical aspects that are important. The trauma that occurs with the spinal cord injury may have been trivial uh, because all it is necessary for syrinx to develop is for that trauma to have set up uh, a scar uh, tissue formation process. Uh, and uh, we probably differ individually as to our likelihood to develop scar tissue with any kind of injury. Uh, and some people can have a trivial injury and develop uh, scar tissue, particularly over the course of time. And in the older literature, you will find that there were reports where there were years between the spine injury and the uh, recognition that this patient had syringomyelia. This is less uh, of an issue today because we are more likely uh, to obtain an MR scan, but in some uh, situations, it still can be that way. And so it was not uncommon for people even who had a spine injury and spinal cord injury with a sensory level to have an episode of coughing or sneezing where suddenly the sensory level would seem to go up from the mid abdomen into the chest for no ex obvious reason. And this is the signal uh, uh, process uh, of uh, extension of the syrinx cavity. Symptoms, uh, this is an old slide, but symptoms uh, particularly are pain, pain with coughing, straining, or sneezing, pain, uh, spontaneous pain, uh, loss of sensation. Uh, people who have a spinal cord injury may have excessive sweating above the level of the injury, and some people with a syrinx may uh, be asymptomatic, and it may be picked up only as an incidental finding on imaging studies. The uh, our recognition of uh, post-traumatic syringomyelia has increased uh, incredibly since the advent of MR scanning, as you can see uh, from the slide. And uh, it is not uncommon in today's world to see uh, post-traumatic syringomyelia. You might ask, of why it is that every patient with a spinal cord injury does not develop syringomyelia. And this is an interesting and very important uh, consideration. Uh, all of us have a central canal that is a very fine channel in the center of the spinal cord at birth. And uh, for the most part, uh, this disappears by uh, about age 10. This is what the canal looks like in histology, and it is, has, has a nice lining. But in most people, uh, this canal uh, within the center of the spinal cord disappears by about age 10. That said, uh, this study out of Japan about 25 years ago showed actually that there are people in their 90s and even beyond who still have a small focus of the central canal present. Now, this central canal has a very typical appearance. It is uh, sort of spindle shaped and oftentimes has an extension, as you can see here, both above and below as a fine line. 
And it may occur in the cervical region as it is here. It can occur in the thoracic region as it is here. And again, you see this rather smooth uh, spindle-shaped cavity with an extension above and below. And when you look at a cross-sectional image of the cord, it is completely round and in the center like a bullseye within the center of the spinal cord. And this is a normal finding. And it's very important to distinguish between true syringomyelia and this condition, which some of us like to call hydromyelia, uh, which is really a residual central canal. And the importance is that this hydromyelia is a benign remnant of uh, our development. It is central, round, and as I showed you, fusiform, whereas uh, syringomyelia is a pathological, abnormal uh, uh, finding. It's a distended cavity, often eccentric and irregular, and is associated with uh, symptoms. And in my own practice, I see many patients uh, who uh, have been diagnosed as having syringomyelia who really have hydromyelia and become very concerned. And often, sometimes the, the hydromyelia is uh, part of an incidental finding when somebody has a scan for some other reason. Uh, but if a patient has symptoms and they have only hydromyelia when I see them, my practice has been to go and to try to identify what their symptoms are really due to because I don't believe that uh, a residual central canal, such as I've shown you, is the cause of any symptoms. So when we do have a true uh, scar from trauma uh, or inflammation, we have to consider uh, the degree of uh, subarachnoid space stenosis, whether it's complete or incomplete, whether it's focal or over a wide area, and whether it is in the lumbar region, in the thoracic region, or in the cervical region, because this makes a difference, particularly if it is a high cervical region uh, scar, as I'll show you in a moment. Uh, <clears throat> Post-traumatic syringomyelia can occur both in the presence of a bone deformity and without uh, a bone deformity, and I'll show you both. Uh, <clears throat> A bone deformity from a spine, severe spine injury, can produce compression of the subarachnoid space. And here is an artist illustration of how a fracture of a cervical vertebra can produce uh, obstruction of the spinal fluid pathways and result in a syrinx cavity formation. And the artist also showed what happens when this is corrected. The syrinx uh, becomes smaller, but as you may already know, very often the syrinx does not com completely disappear, even in the best of circumstances. It is still visible as a fine line. And here is an actual clinical example of such a case where somebody had a fracture right here. And notice the syrinx cavity, which is sort of multi-septated in here. And after correction, the syrinx cavity, though not gone, is considerably uh, less uh, distended. Here is a patient, similar problem, but the injury occurred in the thoracolumbar level. And this patient's syrinx cavity extended all the way into the cervical region from the lumbar, uh, thoracolumbar region into the cervical region. And correction of the deformity resulted in a much, much smaller syrinx cavity with symptomatic improvement. Uh, here is a patient who uh, uh, had no uh, focal scar that could be resected uh, or bony deformity, and we were left with no other option than to shunt this patient. And, uh, this is the way the syrinx looks after the shunt uh, has been uh, placed. Uh, arachnoid, as I said, can scar after trauma, and it may not be a uh, bony abnormality such as I've shown you. 
And here is a case where uh, there's a serin cavity extending into the cervical region, and it's not quite clear where the scar uh, really is. Uh, there's a suggestion of something changing here, but it was a case like this where uh, myelography proved to be very helpful. And on a myelogram, you can see that the contrast abruptly changes caliber here. So we know as surgeons that this is the place where we need to be uh, uh, interactive. And here we are uh, confirming that we are, in fact, at the level of the syrinx cavity. And we opened this up and then placed a dural graft. And here you see a dural graft in position to expand this area. Uh, and after surgery, the syrinx, although not completely gone, is certainly much, much smaller than it was before surgery. Uh, patients who have a high cervical stenosis from an injury in the high cervical cord present a particular problem because doing what I just showed you in uh, the previous patient might be very risky in patients who have a high cervical injury because uh, the uh, neural activation for respiration uh, resides in the high cervical region and manipulating the cord in any way in this area risks uh, uh, making this patient dependent on a respirator for the rest of their life. So we are very careful uh, in this situation. Here's one example of a case like this with a high cervical region and a syrinx right above. Here's another one like that. And you can see that the spinal fluid, which is light in color here, uh, would push up against the cord here at the obstruction and drive uh, fluid into the substance of the cord, as you can see here. So the idea of treating these patients is that if we can somehow divert the pulsations at this level where I have my arrow and conduct this fluid uh, into the peritoneal cavity or chest cavity or someplace else where it can be absorbed, we would diminish the what one of my British colleagues called the filling pressure of uh, the syrinx cavity. And so we perform uh, a shunt from this area, a so-called theco thecoperitoneal shunt uh, to divert the fluid uh, pressure uh, and diminish the syrinx. And sometimes uh, I recall specifically one patient where we did this and the uh, procedure that we performed, uh, which was a, a subarachnoid shunt, made the difference between this patient being able to use his index finger to control the mechanical uh, uh, device for uh, uh, moving his wheelchair, a, a big difference. This is just an artist illustration to show uh, what we are doing to divert the fluid from here above the level of the scar and result in shrinkage of the syrinx cavity as shown here. So they are best for post-inflammatory syrinx with arachnoid adhesions, or uh, as I'll show you in a moment, or post-traumatic syrinx not suitable for a subarachnoid shunt, as I mentioned before. This was actually one of the first patients I ever treated in this way. This was somebody uh, who had undergone resection of a spinal cord tumor at another hospital and developed a syrinx in the area of the spinal cord tumor resection and uh, I decided at that time uh, to place a shunt tubing above the, this level where the adhesion was. And um, uh, lo and behold, the syrinx got much smaller and the patient got significantly better. Now, uh, I want to talk next about uh, these developmental arachnoid cysts or diverticuli, which can also be a cause of syringomyelia. Uh, here's a patient who had a syrinx cavity. It wasn't quite clear why or how. And again, because of this, we performed, uh, oh, here's the axial image, which, by the way, shows that the syrinx cavity 
is not in the center as it was in the persistent central canals off to the side. And uh, in order to clarify the situation, we did a myelogram and showed that there was blockage uh, both from above and below at this level. And when we exposed this, we saw that this is, this is the kind of fold, arachnoid fold, that we call an arachnoid uh, cyst. Uh, you can see how this prevents the fluid from migrating down. And what we do is to excise this membrane, which is just a part of the arachnoid, and then sew in a dural graft. Here is the membrane actually at the time of surgery. And here is the patient uh, after surgery. And you can see that the syrinx is just a fine line. And even on axial images, it's barely visible uh, off to the right side. This is an unusual case. Uh, I've seen only once, but again, you can see a syrinx cavity extending uh, from the thoracic region into the uh, lower cervical area. And here is the uh, obstruction, uh, uh, quite clear. And what we found was that this patient had developed a pouch of arachnoid within the arachnoid. And this balloon that had formed within the arachnoid, uh, made up of arachnoid tissue, acted as a mass preventing the normal flow of spinal fluid. And so we resected that. Here is the pouch filled with a dye that makes it very obvious where it is. And we cut this out. And lo and behold, the patient's syrinx cavity uh, disappeared and uh, has remained uh, gone to this very day. Just this is the area where we did our resection. Uh, Syringomyelia, as I mentioned earlier, can be uh, can form uh, as a delayed consequence of scar tissue when a tumor has been removed. And here is such an instance where uh, this was the area of the tumor. This is the syrinx cavity that has developed. And this is the kind of situation that we encounter dense scar tissue adherent uh, to the cord, and sometimes it's very difficult. You cannot safely remove scar that is this adherent, and the only thing that one can do in a situation like that uh, is um, uh, to do uh, a shunt. This is a, another uh, diffuse situation where there's scar tissue over a wide area right here, forming an irregular syrinx, another adhesion here, and about the only thing one can do for those patients is to shunt the syrinx. You may be familiar with uh, the appearance of a shunt. It is a, a tube of biocompatible material with multiple openings in it. And we insert that with a guide into a uh, syrinx cavity as shown in this uh, artist illustration. But, and while the syrinx shunting is oftentimes the only and best solution to the problem. There are problems uh, that can uh, result from uh, shunt placement. Uh, what you can understand immediately is that if you have a tube with multiple perforations and you place it inside the syrinx cavity, if it really works well, the syrinx will uh, the walls of the syrinx will collapse against these openings and may uh, occlude some or, in the worst scenario, all of the openings. So it, uh, if the mechanism by which the uh, syrinx fills, that is the scar tissue, remains present, the syrinx will fill again, even though this uh, shunt tubing now occluded by a scar uh, is present. And so it's not uh, a surprise that uh, obstruction is the most common type of abnormality that we see in long term uh, consequence of uh, serine shunting. The cord may become tethered, as I'll show you, it can become infected. Rarely, if there's a situation 
such as I showed you at the very beginning of this talk, where there's an opening from the syrinx cavity into the uh, sub spinal subarachnoid space. When you place a shunt into the syrinx cavity, you actually drain the entire uh, cerebrospinal fluid from the fluid uh, surrounding the brain, and you develop a low pressure uh, syndrome, which is associated with headache and may necessitate placement of a uh, shunt valve into the system. Occasionally, problems occur in the uh, peritoneal cavity. Uh, the shunt, I've had one patient who was exercising vigorously and uh, dislocated the shunt. And um, there are other rarer uh, complications. Proximal shunt obstruction, as I told you, we, the patient's tissue can actually grow into the openings of the shunt, as you can see in this particular case where I had to replace the shunt. The shunt can be placed in a one cavity and not the other when there is a septated cavity. Uh, the shunt can anchor the cord and tether it, preventing normal movement of the cord, as in this case. Uh, it can become infected with an abscess and can result in the low pressure state, as I mentioned to you before, necessitating placement of a shunt valve. Neurologic deficit can always occur when the spinal cord is incised, however carefully, to place a shunt tubing. This oftentimes is not consequential. It may be a, a band of numbness, but it is something that one needs to be aware of. And so whenever possible, we, uh, when we need to place a shunt, we try to do it through as small a bony opening as possible and perform uh, only a partial laminectomy rather than a full laminectomy because in some instances, particularly if there's a spinal cord injury, the full laminectomy may result in a spine deformity, even though the laminectomy was performed for uh, placement of a shunt. So a uh, partial hemilaminectomy, as this paper out of Japan showed, is the best way of doing this. This is a deformity that formed in somebody who had a spine injury and then had a laminectomy uh, to place a shunt. You can actually see the shunt tubing. So shunting is the best uh, possible solution when there is no alternative, but we do try to approach the underlying process whenever possible. Um, I just want to uh, enumerate briefly our experience um, with uh, syrinx treatment we performed lots of syringoperitoneal and syringopleural shunts, uh, some subarachnoid decompressions. Occasionally, uh, we had to put in a valve, as you can see. Uh, many patients with uh, primary spinal syringomyelia undergo multiple procedures uh, over a period of time because of blockage uh, or dislocation of the shunt. Uh, we uh, try to perform a decompressive, decompressive laminectomy or duroplasty whenever possible, but occasionally we have to do uh, something else like a bypass uh, or maybe a tumor. Shunt revisions are not uncommon. Um, this just shows you the type of abnormalities that we've found and trauma is obviously the most common form, as I already mentioned, uh, inflammation due to uh, meningitis or subarachnoid hemorrhage is the next most common. Arachnoid cysts uh, in today's practice are actually more common than they were when we uh, created this table. And uh, <clears throat> in most instances, uh, we aim for stabilization uh, patients who've had trauma are the most common ones to require reoperation, as shown in this red line. 
Uh, some are better, many stabilized. Uh, I don't know whether you can see this here, but um, uh, arachnoid cysts have a best possible outcome uh, and require very little reoperation. Uh, and this relates to the surgical procedure and requiring reoperation and chunting. Uh, is the most common one, chunt revisions. Uh, aspiration alone is not really a very adequate form of treating uh, syrinxes, but used to be performed. So uh, the outcome stabilization in many, uh, improvement in some, occasionally they're worse, but we don't see that very often today because our techniques have improved and uh, reoperation remains a problem, particularly after shunting. Uh, idiopathic syringomyelia is syringomyelia for which we do not recognize a cause, and it is far, far less uh, common today, particularly if we uh, don't just rely our, on MR scanning, but in questionable cases, perform CT myelography. So, uh, to conclude, spinal syringomyelia may complicate spinal cord injury, meningitis, or subarachnoid hemorrhage, and it is important in planning to establish the extent and level of the subarachnoid black block. Uh, patients with spinal syringomyelia may face multiple procedures to stabilize their condition, and the outcome is better when we're dealing with a very focal scar rather than a diffuse scar. Shunting is appropriate when there is no alternative and shunting into the subarachnoid space is probably best. Uh, but if we can't do that, we need to shunt into the peritoneal or pleural cavity. Uh, <clears throat> extensive laminectomy is to be avoided because it can lead uh, to spinal deformity. And early diagnosis is helpful because the longer a syrinx cavity has been present, the less likely is that uh, any neurologic symptoms that are associated with it will uh, improve or recover. How can we improve our treatment? We need to look at our failures and not just focus on our good outcomes and look for ways of avoiding these failures. Pain is a problem and pers a persistent problem in many of these patients and Many efforts are underway today to try to deal with uh, pain related to uh, syringomyelia. The future, prevent spinal cord injuries insofar as possible, minimize the effects of injury. And there are a lot of studies today regarding the timing of intervention, uh, which have changed the picture completely for some patients. Control scar tissue formation, that may be an interesting approach for the future. And uh, repairing spinal cord dysfunction is also very much in the forefront today. Thank you very much.